Hello, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I am going to be reading my five most anticipated YA fantasies. Usually in my introductions, I give some long drawn out reason as to why I'm doing a particular video, but to be honest, I just wanted to read these YA fantasies and I wanted an excuse to buy them. So honestly, that's that's what we're doing in this video. We're gonna be reading my most anticipated YA fantasies. I'm gonna briefly tell you which ones I'm gonna read and then I'm gonna read them. I know, super self-explanatory, super easy, super breezy. I hope you guys are ready for it. Up first, we have the book that I am perhaps the most excited about and also the most nervous about. We have Kingdom of the Wicked by Carrie Maniscal this book, I know little to nothing about. I just know that a lot of people have said this is like an enemies to lovers or sort of like a dark romance in a YA book, and I'm excited to read it. I think our hero is like the Prince of Hell or something like that. That's really the only thing that I know. I'm hesitant about this book though because I had really bad luck reading Stalking Jack the Ripper. It just was not a book that I enjoyed, but I feel like this is sort of up my alley and it's been compared to other books that I enjoy, so I'm hoping that I like this one. It was kind of impossible to get my hands on at the time. I think I purchased this a few weeks after it came out and I had to go to a few different Barnes and Nobles to grab this, so I'm hoping that it lives up to my expectations of it, I suppose. <laughs> up next we have These Violet Delights by Chloe Gong. I don't know much about this one again, except for it's set in 1920s Shanghai and it's sort of a Romeo and Juliet retelling, kind of an enemies to lover situation. Again, I'm excited for this one. Anything that has romance kind of at the heart of a story is something that's interesting to me and I've heard really good things about this book, so I'm very excited to give this one a go. Next up we have Cemetery Boys by Aidan Thomas. This is one that I I think I've had on my TBR the longest of all of these books. I don't know if this was the first one to come out of all of these books, but I definitely wanted to pick this one up first and it was one of the books that I knew that I was going to read for this video. This one I'm really excited about because it is about a brujo named Yadriel who is trans. It's about him basically summoning the spirit of someone he's not supposed to have summoned and it sounds spooky and culturally rich and I'm just really excited to give this one a go. The next two books I do own, but I don't own them physically. I purchased them through Libro FM, which is an audible alternative if you guys didn't know. I'll leave a link in the description to Libro if you haven't tried it out before. But the first audiobook that I have is A Song of Wraiths and Ruin. I've heard so many good things about this book, but I haven't heard very specific details about what the book is about. So I'm kind of excited to go into this book not knowing much. The only thing that I really know is that it is an African-inspired fantasy, and I'm always in the market for more culturally diverse fantasies. So excited to give this one a try. And then lastly, we have Legendborn, which is set in North Carolina, I believe, and it follows our main character, Bree. I think it's kind of an Arthurian retelling from what I've heard. I don't know a ton about this one either, but I am so excited to give this one a try as well. I've heard nothing but good things, especially from my friend Mika. Again, I'll link her channel down in the description below, but this is one that I have heard literally nothing but five-star reviews for, so I'm definitely excited to give this one a try. So that's it. Those are the five books that I'm going to be reading for this video. Stay tuned if you want to hear my thoughts on any of these five books. I'll leave chapter markers in the description so you don't get spoiled for anything, but without further ado, let's get into the vlog portion of this video. Okay, sorry that the lighting is a little weird. It's probably like the worst lighting for the first clip, but I am about 10% into Legend Born, and I really, really like this. Do you ever just pick up a book, start reading it, and instantly know that you're gonna love it, and you almost like don't wanna keep reading because you know it's gonna be really good and kind of like ruin you for other books? I'm experiencing that with this book. Just from the even the prologue, the writing is just so good. I don't know what I was expecting going into this book. I don't know, I guess looking at the cover, I expected this to be sort of like a younger demographic YA fantasy, and it's not really that. So our main character, Brie, is 16, and in the prologue of the story, we find out that her mother is dead, and we don't really know what happened to her. And then we're taken to a little while after, and Brie is now in this sort of residential program, is what they call it. It's basically, I think, a summer program for gifted children, and they go to the University of North Carolina to study and get kind of like ahead for college. At her first college party, Brie sees some kind of interesting things go down. She kind of sees what other people can't see, kind of like Clary in City of Bones, and she is trying to figure out kind of what everything means. She figures out that there are people who are legend born who kind of fight monsters, and she's kind of figuring out that her past might not be exactly what she thought it was, and that her mom might have been keeping some secrets from her. Again, I don't want to make all of the comparisons to City of Bones because this is like much better, but it's so good. It's got that like urban fantasy vibe to it, but it's also kind of like academic because like they're in a college setting. And on top of that, this story doesn't shy away from kind of real world issues. Brie is black, her family is black, and there have been a couple of times when she has dealt with law enforcement in this story. And you can kind of see how she feels interacting in the world as a black girl. And I think that's really awesome. I feel like I don't really see that very often in YA fantasy. So it's so good. I don't know what else to say. I am so curious to see where the story goes. I feel like we don't know much about the magic system or about these legend born people. And I'm just excited to kind of see what's happening. It's also kind of reminding me of this show 
on Netflix called The Order. I think that's what it's called. It's, I don't know, they like turn into werewolves, but it's also sort of like academic but funny. And this one hasn't really been funny yet, but it's just giving me like a similar vibe. So I don't know, I'm really liking it. I have a lot more to read. I mean, I'm only 10% in and it's a long book, but I can definitely foresee this being like a favorite book of the year because it's so well written. Okay, I am 40% into Legendborn and it's still fantastic. I think any comparisons that I made to other forms of media, other books and shows or whatever in the prior clips, just throw them out the window. This is completely unique. I mean, I knew it was. I wasn't trying to imply that this book isn't unique based on those comparisons. I don't know. I just personally like context whenever I'm trying to figure out what there's is for me so that's kind of why I like to give comparisons but this is just completely different than anything I've ever read before and I'm just enamored with it I feel like I never want to stop reading this book and I know that's really dramatic but like it's that good <laughs> so we are deeper into the story now I definitely understand where things are going and I'm just excited to get more reveals as the story goes on I don't really know if this is a spoiler because it's kind of talked about in the synopsis of the book but we find out that the magic the legend born people are essentially descendants of the round table so this this is a retelling of like the Arthurian legend, which can be kind of hit or miss for me. Sometimes I'm into it, sometimes I'm not. This is a really, really cool take on it. And just the atmosphere and the ambiance that our author is able to put into the story without making the prose purple is just like, it's impressing me. I'm just so into it. Um, and I think that's what I was trying to communicate by how well written this book is. Obviously it is excellently crafted, but beyond that, the way that she's telling the story is exactly how I like to read a fantasy. I think with fantasy, you really have to give me, you know, world building and everything, but I want to feel transported, even if it's like an urban or paranormal setting. I want to feel like I'm there. I want to understand the richness of the world, and I'm definitely getting that from the way that everything is described and yet again it's not like purple prose i'm not having to sit through like long descriptions so i love that and then the attention to detail when it comes to Bree's characterization and the things she's dealing with it's so impressive to me i feel like i'm trying to kind of revise some things that i said in the prior clip not that i was wrong but i just don't feel like i like adequately described everything but the things that Bree is dealing with in her personal life i think is i don't want to say really cool but i think it's important because in so many ya fantasies we have characters whose parents have died or who were going through things but they don't ever really deal with it and never really feels like a real issue that's kind of my complaint about honestly every book ever <laughs> like YA fantasy new adult stories they try to have these young characters who obviously have ties to their family and yet those bonds never feel real and never feels like the characters really give a shit about their family situation once they're thrown into like a romantic setting or in this case thrown into you know a magical world but Brie is very much trying to balance her real life and her relationships with her best friend and her dad and dealing with the grief of her mother dying and it's just so excellently woven into the fantasy plot that it is it's so good i'm having such a good time reading this like i, I said at the intro of this video it, it takes a lot for me to pick up ya fantasy not because i'm not interested in it honestly it's like the first place i go when i go into a bookstore is the ya fantasy section probably just because of the familiarity but also just because i really like it and i wanted to see if you know i still like it and that's obviously very much the case i just need to pick up the books that i own and pick up the books that i'm excited about i mean i love romance don't get me wrong like that's always going to be number one one in my heart but I just can't give up my fantasy it's just good and this book is no exception I am so impressed I'm very excited to see where the plot goes um I'm liking Bree's developing relationships with Nick and god I cannot remember like the bad guy's name the Merlin it's not really a bad guy but he kind of has like an enemies to I don't know question mark uh relationship with Bree so I think that's super interesting and I'm excited to see if there's a love triangle okay so I finished Legendborn and I have to give this book five stars this was phenomenal I I love the way that this book ended and I would be hard pressed to find a better YA fantasy to read this year and it is mind-blowing to me that I read this like in the first 10 days of the new year that like I found a new like favorite this is definitely going to be a favorite book of the year for me I was just so so impressed by it in every way everything that I said in the previous clips definitely still stands but I think the direction that this story went in was one that I think I sort of expected but it still kind of took me by surprise so at the kind of end of the book we get a little bit more insight into the generational trauma and the lineage, I suppose, of Brie as a character. And I thought that was fascinating. I think there's hints of it kind of at the beginning of the story. You're kind of wondering why her mother died, um, a little bit more about her family in general. And I think at the end of the book, we're given that opportunity to like fully understand Brie's family, Brie's heritage, everything that um, comes with being a part of Brie's family line. So I thought that was a really, really cool inclusion in this book. And I liked, again, this 
combination of fantasy and real world. I think it comes together even more so at the end of the book. I don't want to spoil it, so it's hard to kind of tell you exactly how those things are woven together. We get um, so many reveals though. I loved getting to know a little bit more about Bree's powers. I think in the beginning of the book and even in the synopsis, you're, you're led to believe that Bree is more than just kind of a surface level human, like there's more to her than that, and getting that reveal was so fucking cool. I'm so excited to see where the next book goes. I'm also excited to see where this love triangle goes as well. There is kind of a love triangle that is built at the end of the story. I didn't know if I would like one of the legs of the triangle because I'm kind of not as like into bad boys now, but I sort of think I like him better than Nick, who is supposed to be like the love interest. So I don't know, guys. I just, I love this book so much. If I have one recommendation from this video, I mean, I haven't read any of the other books yet, but if I have one recommendation, it is to pick this book up. Like I said, the cover was something that didn't initially draw me in because I don't know why. I just thought this was going to be like a younger YA. I don't know, but I, I loved this. This is so, so good. And I'm kind of nervous to start the other books now because I just don't know how this book is going to be topped. So the second book that I decided to pick up is Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. This book is so good. I'm 25% in and already the vibes and the pacing are just literally flawless. Like I am, I'm not shocked that both of these books have been excellent, but it is so rare for me to pick up two perfect books in a row. So let me just tell you guys so far what I'm loving about this book. The story itself is about our main character, Yadriel, who is a trans boy growing up in East LA. And right now his greatest desire is to fully become a brujo. He's grown up in brujex culture pretty much his whole life. His dad's a brujo, his mom was a bruja, and he has just always had this desire to just stay steeped in his culture and really, you know, be a part of his culture. But since Yadriel is trans, it has been difficult to get people on his side in him wanting to become a brujo. They're like, no, you couldn't possibly do this. Like, that's not who you are. And it has been really tough for him. And one day, Yadriel decides to take matters into his own hand. And I think with his cousin Maritza, he decides to undergo this brujo ceremony by himself instead of, you know, under the watchful eye of elders who know what they're doing. And in doing so, in kind of awakening his powers, he ends up bringing a spirit into his life that he was not anticipating. Something kind of occurs on the day of the ceremony that he does himself that makes him want to use his powers, and when he does end up using his powers, he ends up calling a spirit that he was not expecting. And I'm just honestly adoring this book. From the very beginning, you get this really lush, atmospheric writing. Again, that's not too wordy, that's not too over the top or, you know, purple prose, kind of like Legendborn. This one gives me a lot of like rich fall vibes to it. I mean, we're obviously in a cemetery for a lot of the story, at least so far, so it kind of makes sense that this story would be kind of moody and atmospheric. Um, but on top of that, I don't know, I'm just getting like all of the moody fall vibes, which I'm really, really liking. Kind of wish I had not started this book in February, but like, you know, better late than ever. But this story was crafted so well, and you can tell that it was so well thought out by our author. From the very beginning of the story, we are given introductions into Yadriel, his family, his home life in a way that is not, you know, overbearing or info dumpy. And from there, we are kind of shown the actions that he's going to take to kind of not correct things, but to take matters into his own hands. And I like that. I like that we're not just like simmering in discontent for chapters and chapters until he finally does something. He takes matters into his own hands in, I think, the first chapter, and we are just thrown into the action. We're following Yadriel and his cousin Maritza and, and this character who is, you know, brought in, um, summoned, I guess, from the afterlife. We're just we're going on this journey from the very beginning. And I love that. While I'm definitely more of a character-driven reader, I feel like this is balancing the plot and the characterization perfectly. So so far, I'm just loving this story and I'm really loving all of the cultural aspects that are interwoven in the story as well. I like that we get to see the family dynamics that are present. We get to explore um, Latinx culture in a way that I feel like I haven't gotten to explore in other books before. I'm having such a good time reading this and I'd honestly be surprised if this is not a four or five star read. Like so far this is really really excellent all right not gonna lie can't remember exactly what i told you guys last time i updated you but i'm 50 percent into cemetery boys by aiden thomas and i'm enjoying it I kind of wasn't sure if I was enjoying the direction things were going for a while because I'm not sure that I am fully convinced of Julian's character and like if I like him or not, but I am. I am liking his character and I am liking the direction of the story. So I think I told you guys last time, I think, because again, I can't really remember what I said, that I'm liking kind of the spooky atmosphere and I'm liking how the action picks up from the very beginning and I'm definitely still liking that. My only hesitation really with the story is that the spirit that Yadriel summons Julian 
is this kind of like troublemaker boy at his school and he's a little bit I mean he's like a lovable himbo is kind of what I am going to describe him as it's kind of his archetype which I'm liking but at the beginning I was like he's a little irritating I'm not sure if he's going to be someone I root for and that's pretty crucial because a lot of this story revolves around figuring out what happened to Julian why he is deceased and why Yadriel's cousin is deceased like why are people dying across East LA like what's happening I'm really liking the mystery aspect of it I'm not gonna lie I was again on the fence I just didn't really know at some points kind of where the story was gonna go and I do think we've spent a little bit too much time in the pondering phase of things like I want the action to pick up again but I think it has at this point we had a lot of action at the very beginning and then sort of a lull but now we're kind of back into the action and I'm I'm enjoying it it's still really great and I'm loving just the subtlety of the story honestly like there are so many cool little cultural nuggets that I am picking up on and really liking I also just love that this is a story with a trans main character that doesn't shy away from you know the hard things that Dodriel is dealing with but at the same time this is not a story about trauma which I love like I love that this is a story about a trans boy who's just trying to you know stay close to his culture and like kick ass and I love that so so far so good like I really think this could be a four or five star read for me which is so exciting because I loved Legendborn and I would love to give this one a super high rating too I think the only thing that could really stop me from enjoying this book is if the Julian Yadriel relationship doesn't develop in a way that I like if that makes sense right now there's a lot of tension between them and I like like how Julian is very respectful and he's like not an asshole like he, he's definitely not like a bully in terms of like being a bad boy but he is a little bit irritating and he definitely wants to do things his own way even though he's like dead so I hope that he starts to kind of listen to Yadriel more and I love YA because I feel like as a genre you get a lot of growth with your characters which is honestly kind of rare in some other age categories I feel like or at least it has been in some of the books that I've been reading lately so it's so nice to like visit YA and just get characters who actually grow and change and I'm hoping that's the case for this book I'm sure it will be and I'm curious to see kind of what the friendship or relationship looks like between Julian and Yadriel. Trail. I've talked enough. I'm gonna go and finish this book. I'll update you guys when I'm done. Okay, so I'm editing this video right now and I realized that I never gave a final update for Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. I still have the book. It's upstairs, but I didn't want to go get it. But I thought I'd give you guys my final thoughts. So I ended up giving this book four stars. I really, really ended up enjoying it. The only thing that was keeping me from giving this book five stars was the ending. I felt like it was just a tad too predictable. And there were a couple of events that happened that I was like, that seems unrealistic. I mean, I know the story has fantastical elements, but there were just a couple of things that I was like frustrated by. And I don't really want to spoil what those things are. I know that I've been like spoiling things throughout this video, but I really do want you guys to pick this book up and pick a lot of these books up. So while I might like hint at some plot points, I try not to like spoil the entire ending of a book. So I'm not going to tell you like who done it or you know what those <laughs> reveals were, but they just felt really predictable. And I think if you had read the introduction to this book, you probably could have guessed how it was going to end. And I wanted there to be like an element of surprise there and there just really wasn't. So that was a little disappointing for me, but I just feel like there were so many important things in this book. I thought the setting was absolutely beautiful but also having a trans main character who, you know, is struggling, but you know, the story is not about trauma awesome. I really liked too how that was handled near the end. I thought that was really, really cool. And seeing Yadriel's family, um, specifically his dad, come to accept him was so beautiful and it was really heartwarming and I just, I loved it. So I will say too, I think this story is particularly cool because to me it reads for a slightly younger YA demographic and I think that's really important. I think we see so much of this like Sarah J Mass stuff kind of targeted at YA audiences and I think there are people who want to read that, but I do think it's important to have stories for people, you know, on the young Younger side of YA or you know like entering high school rather than like you know for 18 year olds so I think the story definitely serves a purpose. I think everyone should read it. Anyway, I, I really liked it and um, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it. In fact, I'm recommending it to all of you. If you're watching this clip and you were like, you know, I don't care if I'm spoiled for it because I'm not gonna read it, go read this book. I'm gonna get off my soapbox and then we can move on to the next book. Okay, I hope you guys don't mind. I ended up switching cameras because this one is just so much nicer quality wise, like visually, audio, whatever. I was actually editing the first couple of clips of this video and I was like, I don't like this. So I just switched mid video because I can do it. But I am not that far, honestly, like 42 pages into Kingdom of the Wicked by Carrie Maniscalco. And uh, mm. so this story is about 
Amelia and her twin Vittoria, and they are witches in Italy. And there are other witch families as well in her Italian town, and their main goal, I don't actually know what their main goal is to be honest, I just know that the the main conflict here is that there are these princes of hell that we're trying to avoid at all costs, and we've got magical necklaces that are supposed to keep these demon princes of hell away. And one night, Amelia finds someone drinking blood over a dead body. That's kind of where I've left off. Wow, it really sounds like I have no idea what I'm talking about, and honestly, that's entirely true. I just wish I liked Carrie Maniscalco's writing. I really do. I'm gonna continue reading this book. Maybe the story is gonna be so impressive that I'm willing to overlook her writing, but it's so, I don't wanna say clunky because that feels mean. It's not like poorly written. It's just, I'm not having all of my questions answered, I guess is really my issue here. So the setting has been really beautiful from what has been described. We've got these kind of lush descriptions of food and this Italian restaurant. Can it be called an Italian restaurant if the restaurant's in Italy? They work at this restaurant called Sea and Vine that her family owns, both, you know, Amelia and Vittoria, they work there, whatever. And this, the food descriptions are beautiful and the descriptions of the town, like everything is really picturesque. And yet I have no idea when this is set. There's no indication anywhere really when this is set. I mean, we do have like castles and shit in the back of the book, but I mean, this could be really set anytime. And it's frustrating me because I don't think it's supposed to be historical, but also I need some context. Like, do people have cell phones? I, I heard something about long skirts, but like, I don't really, I don't know, it's frustrating me. I know it shouldn't frustrate me this much, but like it is irritating me. I was tempted to go and look at art for this book to see kind of how people are dressed, but that's annoying. I like, I don't like that in the first 40 pages, we've got the setup for this book. And yet I, I have no idea like where we're at time wise, you know, if it's a fantasy, like like, okay, cool. Like I can kind of, I can kind of vibe with it, but it, since it's set in Italy, like this is a real place. So when is it set? That's strike number one. And it has really, really, really been irritating me. I know it's like a small thing, but it's really been bugging me. I mean, like I'm trying to visualize, right? Like I'm reading, I'm trying to visualize. And then on top of that, just, it's like, we're getting a lot of description and we're getting a little bit of setup, but nothing really feels high stakes. And I don't really care about the fact that these princes of hell might be after the girls. Is that bad? I don't know. It's like Nono is trying to kind of warn us, but also it, the stakes aren't really there because we hear that these girls can do magic, but we have no idea what that magic looks like. All we know about is these magic fucking necklaces. So anyway, um, I should probably stop talking about those until you get farther in, but I just wanted to let you know that that's how I'm feeling initially upon reading this book. Once I get like 50% in, I'll probably give you guys like a, this is what's happening. If I can even get there, I will get there. I will, I will get there. But so far, I don't know. Okay. Where to begin? I am 50% into Kingdom of the Wicked and my feelings are kind of similar to what I was telling you guys yesterday. I feel like while things are starting to make more sense and where I kind of get where the story's going, it's very slow moving and I'm still just not loving the writing. So that just off the bat is something to note. Since we last talked, quite a bit has happened. And again, now I do know where the story's going. We have Amelia who, you know, finds this dead body, which I think I told you guys last time. If not, she finds a dead body. And the next chapter we find out it is her sister. One thing that kind of irritated me about that was that the synopsis does a better job of explaining what happened in that moment and in those like couple of scenes than the actual book does. You have Amelia talking to her sister in their grandmother's kitchen, like in the kitchen of the restaurant that they're both in. And then the next chapter you have Amelia trying to search for her sister. And there's no context as to where her sister's gone. It's not like her grandma's like, hey, can you go search for your sister? It's like a scene with them together and then the next chapter we're trying to find. Victoria. And I'm like, what? I had to like go back and read it a couple times to make sure that I wasn't like missing a chapter or something. No, it's just the way Carrie Maniscalco writes. And I, I don't get it. I don't understand why. But we find Vittoria. She's dead. Her heart has been ripped out and she's found at a monastery, but she has a prince of hell leaning over her and licking like her blood off of his fingers. And Amelia sees this and is like, oh fuck. She is now making it her life's mission to figure out what prince of hell did this to her or who wants to kill all of these witches that have been going missing. She ends up summoning a prince of hell instead of a lesser demon to help her. It's Raph. That's like the seven sin guy that she like summons or whatever. And so far the story has just been like her having pseudo sexual encounters with Raph and then like nothing else really happens. I think she's trying to like solve the mystery and she has had encounters with some of the other princes, but nothing has really come of it. We haven't gotten any really solid clues about what's going on. We have found out a little bit more about the like magical necklaces. And apparently those are like the actual horns of the devil, which I guess is kind of cool. And you know, dumbass that she is, she takes hers off at one point and it gets stolen. I just feel like there's a lot of pieces here, a lot of like 
like disparate pieces that are not being put together in a way that like is driving the story forward, you know? And that's a little disappointing because I want to like this. I actually do want to like this. I like a good paranormal romance. I mean, one of my favorite romance heroes is named Wrath, so I want to like this Wrath, but so far he's just kind of bland and he's giving me not Thomas Cresswell vibes, but similar levels of irritating and not really developed enough for me to care. Like I want to hear his tragic backstory. I want there to be something there. I don't know. I didn't realize this was going to be framed as a murder mystery, which is kind of stupid of me because like it literally says in the flap of the book, oh, her sister's dead and she needs to like figure it out. I should have known that this was going to be a mystery, but it's not a very successful mystery in my opinion. Yeah, it's giving me Stalking Jack the River vibes, which unsurprising, it's written by the same author, but I was just expecting more, I guess. I'm gonna finish this and I'll give you guys my thoughts when I'm done. Maybe it'll turn around. I'm not, I'm not hating it to be honest. Like this is a more successful attempt, I guess, than Stalking Jack the Ripper. At least like the setting is pretty. I think if I were to rate it, I'd probably give it three stars. It's like sort of generous. Maybe in the next like 50%, it's gonna ratchet itself up to 100%, like 100% enjoyment, five stars. We'll see. Okay, so I finished Kingdom of the Wicked and sadly my hopes of this being a five star no, this this is a two star book and I'm sad to say that but I do think that a lot of people will enjoy this It really felt a lot like stalking Jack the Ripper in pretty much every way except for setting the reveal at the end The seemingly random plot that eventually leads to the solving of a mystery Like it's got all of that stuff going on with the addition of a hero hero with the addition of a love interest <laughs> That I think is slightly more interesting than Thomas Cresswell. So I feel like if you liked Stalking Jack the Ripper, you will likely enjoy this. It just didn't work for me because Carrie Maniscalco's writing doesn't work for me. There's really not much more to say than that, and I'm sad that I didn't enjoy this book because I had really high hopes for it, especially since, you know, like Demon Daddy of Hell, like that, that's stuff I like. But this like really failed in the execution and so many of the chapters just felt so disjointed. And I don't feel like I realized that so much when I was reading Stalking Jack the Ripper. I just knew I didn't really like Audrey Rose and I didn't really like Thomas Cresswell. Like the characters were really what didn't work for me in that. And then the reveal did feel weird, but I felt like the plot made maybe a little bit more sense in that book. This one, it's just so disjointed, so random. Chapters are linear, I suppose, but there's like big time jumps between things or, you know, we'll go from like one scene and then the next chapter's completely different scene. And it's not something that was like talked about in the previous chapter, if that makes sense. Like it just didn't, it did not make sense to me. The setting was really beautiful. I don't think this writing is terrible. I just feel like some decisions were made that I just didn't personally love. And that sucks because I wanted to like this, but you know, you win some, you lose some. Having two really good books in a row and then following up with this one, like it hurts a little bit less, I guess. So that's all I really have to say. I do, however, have another book that I need to start in on today. I'm supposed to be posting this video in a day and I have two more books to read, which is a little intimidating, but I think I can get it done if I start now. It's noon on Wednesday, 17th of March. So I think if I get this one done today and then read another one tomorrow, we should be good. I don't know. You, you guys don't care about the logistics, I'm sure, but just know that I procrastinate more than I let on. I'm gonna read These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong next because I am in a physical reading sort of mood and the last book that I have is an audiobook, so I feel like this is kind of the move. And I'm hoping that this will give me everything that I wanted from Kingdom of the Wicked, like a YA that has quite a bit of romance in it, um, but like done better. So hoping I enjoy this. I'll probably update you guys once I'm like 100 pages in and kind of let you know where the story is going, what the story is about. I really don't know much about this except, you know, all of the blurbs I've heard, like Romeo and Juliet, enemies to lovers, you know, Shanghai 1920s situation. But I don't really know what like the plot of the story is and like beyond the enemies to lovers, like what, what is there? I'm excited to find out, truly. I feel like I've heard so much buzz about this book and I've seen this on Bookstagram so many times, but I don't think I've seen a lot of people reading it. And that seems to just be kind of a recurring theme. I've noticed, uh, at least with some of these like more popular kind of anticipated YA titles, I see a lot of pictures and then not a lot of reviews, which I mean, that's just like par for the course when it comes to, you know, the book community. Like we, we buy a lot of books and don't read them, but I would love to see more people actually picking these things up. And so hopefully maybe this will inspire you. I don't know. I, I'm gonna read this and stop babbling. <laughs> Murderous bugs. That's the answer to like what the main conflict of this book is. Let me start from the beginning. I am enjoying this. This is very good. It opened so strongly. The writing is just like worlds and leagues above Carrie Maniscalco's. No offense, Carrie Maniscalco. I am so impressed that a college student whose debut novel this is, like how? 
just how <laughs> that is my main thought so far like this is just so well written and it reminds me a bit of the diviners by Libba bray in terms of like tone and atmosphere i mean i guess they're both set in the 20s so it makes sense overall just kind of similar vibes if you like that book i feel like you would probably enjoy this but essentially this book is about our main character juliet who is the daughter of like a mob boss and the gang itself is called the scarlet gang she's come back from america after studying and she is ready to kind of like take over her dad's still in charge but she's kind of like learning the ropes and trying to kind of assert her dominance essentially making sure that she can be the leader. Some stuff is afoot in the city that is making her concerned. There has been a not string of murders but mysterious deaths that have taken place and we're starting to find out that there are these bugs that have been infecting people and making them kill themselves in really brutal and gruesome ways. The way we found this out was in the prologue of this book or like right after the prologue which was like really nice and brutal. We have people from the Scarlet Gang and a rival gang called the White Flowers at this dock and they have met their end particularly gruesomely. We don't really know at the beginning like what exactly has occurred and as time goes on we're figuring out that there are these bugs that are infecting people and making them kill themselves. It's really brutal very interesting. Juliet is kind of having to interact with a member of the rival gang, the White Flowers. His name is Roma. He's Russian and it's so fascinating. Like I am loving their interactions. They definitely have a history and a past which I'm liking. So it's not like entirely true to the Romeo and Juliet retelling thing because Romeo and Juliet don't really have like a past, right? But they had sort of a fling and he betrayed her. A lot of people ended up dead because of some information that she thinks that he acted on. I think we're probably gonna find out later that like it was a misunderstanding and like he didn't actually betray her but anyway right now she's really bitter and angry at him and there's definitely still some tension there which I'm I'm liking. I'm liking the way the tension is built. It feels like the relationship writing in this is just much more mature I guess you could say than in the last book. I hate to compare everything to Kingdom of the Wicked but since it's just what I read last easy to compare but I just really am liking this. It is slow moving. I will say the pace is kind of slow but it's atmospheric and I'm excited for the secrets to unfold. This is definitely carrying along in a more linear fashion in a, a way that makes sense. There's no like weird time jumps. The chapters don't like feel disjointed. Yes, I like this a lot. This is really good. I want to see more interactions between Roma and Juliet, but other than that, I have no complaints. This is really, really solid. So thank God. <laughs> I mean, I can take one dud, but I don't think I can take any more than one in this video. I feel like the past few videos I've been doing, I just like have not been liking the books I've been picking up. Then stuff like this comes around and it's like, hey, here, have a good book. I'm gonna go ahead and keep reading. I don't think I told you guys how far I am. I'm a little over 100 pages in. I think I'll be able to finish this tonight just because it's only like 5.30 and I have plenty of time, so I'll be back. All right, I'll keep it brief because the lighting is pretty bad, but I'm 50% into these Violent Delights and I don't really have much to say, to be honest. It is carrying on in a similar fashion to when I last talked to you guys. It is still slow moving, but we're getting more plot. There has been developments in the murder bugs and we're finding out that there might be more afoot than just the murder bugs there might be a murder monster in the port harbor whatever which is kind of fun and we have Juliet and Roma teaming up to kind of figure out what is plaguing the city because their respective parents don't seem to really give a shit I think it's fun I like them teaming up I like the kind of romantic tension between the two of them it is fun to watch and I'm also liking the I don't want to say complexity of the story but there is a lot of additional commentary besides just this like kind of you know murder mystery plot sort of thing we also have kind of like anti-imperialist I don't want to say tones I mean Juliet is just very like anti-imperialist because we have, you know, French people who are trying to kind of tell her family what to do. And Juliet's very anti. She like goes against her family a lot of the times and it's like, y'all, why are you putting up with this shit? I don't know. I'm liking that. I like the history that I'm learning as a part of this. Like I did not realize that there was such a big immigration of people from Russia to China uh, during this time period. I did some like Googling uh, because I was interested in the history around this time period. So books like this are always fun because it is a way to explore history in a way that is exciting. And it definitely sparks my curiosity which I'm really really liking so so far so good. I don't have anything particularly revolutionary to say beyond that but I will finish this up and let you guys know my official thoughts but I really can't see this being any less than a four or five star. Okay so I finished These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong and I don't know <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this book. I think I'm going to give it four stars. I think it's maybe closer to a three and a half star book which sucks because I really had anticipated loving this and I was loving it up until um I would say like the 75% mark but there were just some things that happened or I guess honestly there were some things that didn't happen that I wanted to happen that affected my enjoyment of this book. I don't want to go into too many details because I don't want to spoil kind of the ending and the whodunit mystery part of this story, but overall I just feel like the romance, while it was um, 
in my opinion, pretty mature and well thought out. There weren't as many scenes between our hero and heroine as I had wanted. I think if you're someone who really likes a good slow burn and you really want like tension and like quotes between your characters, if that makes sense. If you're into Kaz and Inej, I feel like you would like the couple in this book because the interactions are similar there. You know what I mean? They've got a history, they've got a past, they have some interactions, but they're not truly romantic interactions or at least not traditionally romantic interactions. I think you'll like this. I personally was wanting just a little, just a little bit more, you know, because we've got such a history between the two. So I was hoping we'd see some payoff and we didn't really see payoff in that regard. And then when it comes to the plot, I did kind of mention that it was slow moving. And I think that's very accurate to the entire book. There was, I guess, like a big scene at the end, but it didn't really lead anywhere. There wasn't a satisfying conclusion, but there also wasn't like a big you know, cliffhanger either. So I was just feeling a little let down slash underwhelmed at the end of the book. So it was like, there was so much potential here and the writing is awesome. I love the elements of history at play. I just wanted there to be more elements of the fantasy and of the adventure. And it felt more like a slow moving detective novel almost. That's kind of the, the vibe that you get from this. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read The Diviners, but I really do think if you liked The Diviners, you would probably enjoy this. Yeah, that's how I felt. I don't know. I, I liked it and I think you should pick it up for sure, but it just wasn't like, my perfect novel. And that's sort of how I felt about Cemetery Boys too. So it's, again, it's not like I don't recommend you picking them up. I just, you know, I wanted, I wanted a little bit more and that's okay because I know that this will be kind of like a perfect novel for a lot of people. So anyway, I am now ready to move on to A Song of Wraiths and Ruin. I hope you guys are excited about it because I'm excited about it. And I say like, I'm ready to move on. I've already moved on, if I'm being honest. It is Thursday morning um, on March 18th. I can't remember what yesterday was. I just know today is Thursday and I'm posting this video today and I need to finish this book today. But I've gotten a few hours into the audiobook and I thought we could talk about it. So, so far a lot has actually happened in this book and I'm liking the contrast and pacing between this book and these violent delights. It's nice going from something sort of slow moving to something that's very actiony and fast paced. So we have Karina and Malik. They are our two main characters and the two POVs in the story. Malik is escaping his kind of like war torn country and he is trying to find a new home in Zoran, which is the country that Karina is going to rule one day. So Malik comes on the day of the Solstasia festival, not like the day of, but you know, around the time of this like big festival that only happens every 50 years in this country. And he escapes with his two sisters and he's trying to find a new life for himself. But things become a little tricky when his younger sister Nadia is abducted and he has to kill the crown princess Karina to eventually save his sister. That is the kind of deal that he makes with the spirit because the spirit is unhappy that Karina and Karina's mom like ruled the lands. He ends up kind of getting into a situation where he has to kind of compete in these trials that happen during Solstasia. He ends up being like, you know, this miraculous chosen one who is asked to compete against, you know, other people who are also competing. And he's just kind of thrown into this situation. It's sort of like a Katniss situation. Like he hasn't been training his whole life for these trials, but he is kind of thrown into them, thrust into them. And where I left off, he is, you know, kind of preparing himself mentally and physically as in, you know, getting all cleaned up, getting ready, to kind of face this battle. And then we also have Karina's point of view. So Karina, a lot has happened for her. Her father and her older sister have passed away and she's still kind of dealing with the grief of that and dealing with the fact that she eventually is going to have to take over the kingdom of Zeron one day. So she is still very angry. She doesn't like the responsibility. She wants to kind of play music and her mom is upset that she is kind of shirking her responsibilities and not really taking seriously this role that she's going to have to take on. And unfortunately, one day when Karina and her mom are talking, her mom and of being murdered by an assassin. And Karina is quickly thrust into the situation that she didn't necessarily anticipate. So I think that's kind of a common theme between the two characters. Malik is having to compete in these trials that he never thought he was going to have to compete in. And then you also have Karina who's having to take over for her mom. And while she knew that she was eventually going to have to, she didn't really fully consider what that meant or um, ever anticipate it would happen as quickly uh, or as soon as it did. So she is ensuring that this festival still happen even though her mom is deceased because this festival is something that ensures that everyone in this city is safe. And so she's having to kind of take care of this and also deal with her grief. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving pieces. I think eventually Malik and um, Karina are going to have some interactions since he is tasked with killing her. But so far, so good. I'm really loving, again, the fast moving plot. I'm enjoying the characters. There's a lot at stake here. I don't feel like either of the characters is necessarily 100% fleshed out, but I definitely understand 
understand their motivations. I understand where they're coming from and I am just liking the story. I think it's really entertaining and while it does kind of fall into some tropes that I don't necessarily love, like I, I typically don't pick up fantasies that are about royals, like that's not usually my thing. This is such a fresh take that I am kind of enjoying what's going on. So I'm excited to continue reading this book. I'll give you guys an update once I hit the 50% mark and um, then I'll finish this book and then we'll be done with the video. I know, kind of wild. I can't believe that I'm actually gonna probably post this video today. No one's more surprised than me. I will be back once I am 50% in. Okay, so I didn't lie per se, but some stuff came up at work and I had to do a bunch of shit and also listen to this audiobook while I did it. Like I didn't have time to pause and give you guys a 50% update. So I'm just gonna tell you guys my final thoughts on this book. I don't exactly know how to feel about it. There were a lot of things that I think worked really, really well about this book. There are a lot of things that just didn't work for me personally, but I know could work for other people. So let me try to kind of tell you what those things are. So first of all, um, I think I mentioned it in the last clip, but royalty sort of stories, whether it's, you know, a fantasy or contemporary, tend to not work for me. I don't know what it is. It hasn't always been the case for me, but it seems like most royalty type stories that I pick up lately, I just haven't really like gelled with very much. Maybe because it's something that I can't relate to in any regard. Maybe that's it. I don't really, I, I don't know. Uh, trying to psychologize probably isn't smart, but I just tend to not like that sort of trope. And then on top of that, sadly, I just didn't like Karina's character. I was dreading her chapters like every time they came around because she was just, I don't even know how to put it into words. Like I understand where she was coming from a lot of the time. She was very angry at her mom for dying, I guess. She wasn't mad at her mom for dying, but she was just a really angry character, very vengeful, also immature at the same time. It didn't feel like it was coming from this place of like righteous anger. I don't know. I just, I couldn't really relate to her character and I just didn't really like hearing from her point of view. By contrast, I did enjoy Malik's point of view though. I feel like he's so different than any hero that I've read in a YA book in a really long time. I feel like usually, well, even, even adult books, we have heroes who tend to be a little bit more gruff and like don't show their emotions and Malik is definitely not like that, but he also didn't fall into like a stereotypically soft role either. I know in a lot of like V.E. Schwab books you have like a really hardened female main character and then a really really soft male character, but like very flat. <laughs> um, this wasn't the case. Like Malik, I feel like was very developed. I understood where he was coming from. I liked the anxiety rep. I liked his chapters, but it was hard to sort of enjoy the whole story when the story is told from two points of view and I didn't really enjoy Karina's point of view. And on top of that, she was also royalty. So it was like, not really my thing. And then I think the ending and just overall setup of this book just was a little, I don't want to say predictable, but kind of, I don't know. Maybe I'm just like, I'm kind of burnt out on the whole like, necromancy thing <laughs> after reading um, Cemetery Boys. I don't know. This wasn't bad, obviously. Like I, I enjoyed it and I'm kind of torn on whether I want to give this three and a half or four stars. It just wasn't my perfect my fantasy and that's perfectly fine because I did actually still have a good time reading it and I would recommend the audiobook if you want to give it a try. Like I said, I'll leave a link to Libro in the comments or in the description because that's how I access this and uh, if you click the link below, I don't know if you'll get anything special because I'm not really like an affiliate with them, <laughs> but but uh, I think it's a really great service and you are contributing to whatever like local bookstore you want to contribute to. It's like going into a regular bookstore so you don't have to go anywhere. I don't know what else to say at this point. I had a really good time doing this video. I definitely discovered a new favorite YA fantasy, which I am so surprised by. I mean, I, I expected to like most of these books, but I didn't expect to come away from this video with like having a new, like all time favorite, honestly, Legendborn, like game changing. You have to pick it up. If you haven't picked it up, pick it the fuck up because it's so good. And then honestly pick all of the other books up too. I feel like there's such merit in each one of these titles, except for maybe Kingdom of the Wicked. You could probably skip that one. All the other ones though, definitely are important in their individual ways and are just overall like fun reads. So I don't know, I had a really good time doing this. I love YA fantasy and I've missed it and I'm just excited that I got to read all of my anticipated titles. So thank you for sticking around this long. Honestly, hopefully this wasn't too bad. I think this is gonna be like a 45 minute video for you guys. Again, thanks so much for watching. I appreciate you guys so much. I have a new video coming on Sunday that is romance related. I love you guys so much and until next Sunday.